Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. What do you think you are entitled to? There's a lot of talk in our country about rights and things that we're entitled to. And these are things that we think we deserve just because we're living human beings. Things we don't have to earn, right? Things that are just ours. However, as we ask ourselves that question this morning, the context is a little different than normal. The context for this question is that we are asking this of God, the creator of all things, the creator of you and me. And as we face him and ask this question, what are we entitled to so often we forget the state of play when it comes to the cosmic forces at work in the world. It's easy to think in our country and on earth that we do have things we're entitled to. But when it comes to the arena of God, all of those no longer sustain us. All of those things are no longer there. So let's remind ourselves where things stand. God made you. And when he made us human beings at the beginning, we were perfect. Adam and Eve were perfect. God saw what he had made and said it was very good. But then the devil came into the garden, tempted Adam and Eve, and they fell into sin. They sinned against the God who made them. Effectively, what that means is they've aligned themselves against God. They made him their enemy. If you recall, the particular temptation that they fell prey to was that they would know good and evil and be like God. And then, of course, now we live in the disaster that has ensued from there. God exiled us from paradise for our sin, yet very quickly promised deliverance through the offspring of Eve. And since then, if you've read any of the scriptures, in the Old Testament especially, is the story of God gathering his people back to himself despite their best efforts to run away from him, to worship other gods, to do the very things he asks them not to do, or to avoid doing the very things he asks them to do. It's true today still. We stray continually running from what God wants us to do, running from what he wants to give us, even though it's the greatest treasure in the universe. So if that is the state of play, is that, that is the condition we find ourselves in, then every act of God henceforth has been a mercy on a people who deserved nothing. After all, God would have been completely justified after his creation had aligned themselves against him to erase everything and begin again. And yet he chose in mercy not to do so. And we find out later in John 3 why. Because he loves you. He loves me. So in that love, he doesn't leave us to this fate of constantly straying and running away from God. He knows we cannot seek him. We're not even looking. And so he seeks us. He sends his son Jesus. Not to whip us into shape by demanding that we do the thing that we have failed to do since the Garden of Eden. But by doing it in our place. By bearing the penalty meant for us who have made ourselves enemies of God. And as was mentioned at the beginning of the service, through our baptism, claiming us as his own. It is into that context that somebody asks Jesus the question, Lord, will those who are saved be few? From our gospel reading today in Luke chapter 13. 
Lord, will those who are saved be few? Now, this is the question, right? This is our ultimate concern. Otherwise, we're just done for. There's no reason to get out of bed in the morning. There's no reason to go to work or school because once you're dead, you're dead and it's done. So what's the point? So a pretty important question. And maybe you should be asking Jesus that question. But it's an interesting way to ask the question because you can't quite tell what the person means. He doesn't say, am I going to be saved? He seems to be speaking on behalf of concern for other people. And that's one way to look at it. But I believe that Jesus' response indicates that there's a different work at play here. You see, at this time among the Jews, they believed they were the people of God. True, they were. But they believed that because of that, they were the only ones who would be saved. They believed that the Messiah was to come to liberate them and save them. And we'll look at parts of Jesus' answer that indicate that he's responding to this belief. Because Jesus' response is sort of odd. Seems harsh and scary. Because he's teaching against complacency and entitlement in the promises of God. And when it comes to our salvation. And he does this by giving three warnings. The first is, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. The warning here is to strive because not everyone's going to make it. Scary thought. Then your next question might be, am I one that will make it? Well, this is a warning for right now. It's a warning to be on guard. Seek the kingdom. Take your faith seriously by hearing God's word. By doing what he asks you to do. That's what faith is. Faith agrees with what God is doing. And that, of course, isn't a work of our own. It's a work of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us by God's grace. We don't know why, but for some reason he has allowed us to run from that gift. To turn away from that gift. And so he's asking you to not do that. To live in faith. To repent to die to self and rise to this new life he's bringing to you. That's what happened in, in your baptism. The old you was put to death. The old you who was an enemy of God. Gone. And now a new life rises, which is Christ's, now in you. So striving here is the work of faith. The repentance of our sins, which we just did this morning. Confronting the harsh reality of the state of play, of our own condition, and throwing ourselves at the feet of Jesus, appealing to his mercy. And what does he do? He gives it freely, without condition. So striving is the baptismal life, daily dying to self, and here again, it warns us against the complacency, even in our baptismal promises, to think that, that I was baptized some, some years ago, and now I don't have to listen to anything Jesus says, or go to church, or be in his word, or do any of those things. And it'll be okay, because I was baptized 37 years ago. Luther describes baptism as a daily thing. It's a daily reality that you now live in, that's constantly being fed to you. And it is a joyous occasion after which everything is different because now God is coming to you in grace and peace and not in wrath and judgment. The second warning that Jesus gives, when once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. For me, this is one of the more horrifying lines in Scripture. I mean, imagine 
Jesus saying that to you? I don't know where you came from. I don't know you. And then you insist all the more. And this culminates in verse 27 when he says, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. It's a scary thought to hear that from God. Is Jesus trying to scare us? What's he doing here? In a way, yes. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, we learn in the Proverbs. And he's scaring us not so that we would despair, but so that we would cling to him. He's warning us the door is not always going to be open. It's going to be closed at some point. And once that is done, if you are on the outside, the time of learning, teaching, preaching, faith is done. Despite what you insist Despite even saying what they say here, which is that we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. Dear friends in Christ, there are many people who dined with Jesus and heard what he had to say and turned away from him. So it is with us that just by coming to church and occasionally hearing the scriptures, Jesus is telling us that's no guarantee Cling to faith. Faith is what animates all of those things. Faith given by the Holy Spirit. Don't reject it. Don't be led astray by something else thinking that I have all the time in the world to make this decision only to find the door closed. And his final warning, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out, and people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. His final warning, a future prediction for what awaits those outside the door. Not a pleasant place, weeping and gnashing of teeth, For those who think they're entitled to what they think is theirs, not by virtue of the works of Jesus, but by some other means, this warning is for them. For those who think that they are going to gain access by virtue of their heritage, their parents, even their own baptism that they take for granted, They think they're entitled to recline at the table of Jesus because of those things, not because he has opened the door and invited them in and brought them in through his life, death, and resurrection. For those, it will not be good, and they won't end up where they expect. And this is really where Jesus is preaching against this idea that the Jews have, that because they're the people of God, they're the few that will be saved, and the rest of the unclean, unshaven, unwashed rabble is going to be left outside. Because here he says, And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Those are the Gentiles. Those are you and me, the people of all the other nations. So Jesus is saying here, those of you who think that you're in just because you're Jews, if you reject me and what I've come to bring, which is no less than the grace and love of God for you, because you're a sinner, you made yourself an enemy of me, I come in mercy to fix that, to redeem that to make you new and whole. Cling to me. This is what Jesus is saying. And he sums up his sentiment about complacency and entitlement in our very last verse. He says, And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. This always brings to mind when you're a pastor's kid. I know we have a few out there. You can probably relate to this. That when you're waiting in line for food after church, when you're the pastor's kid, you think you're a little bit entitled to maybe go first. 
So you get first in line, and my dad would always put me in my place with this scripture. Some who are first will be last, and some who are last will be first. So then you had to wait to the very end of the line. Right? Because I had forgotten my place. I thought because this was like a second home to me, I could do whatever I want. And it turns out that's not true. Now, maybe he wasn't thinking of that entirely as he was saying that to me. Maybe he just wanted to humble his young son who thought that he could be first in line to everything. But through the Holy Spirit, it has taught me that lesson that Jesus intends to teach us today. Don't become entitled to the gifts of your faith by anything other than Jesus. Don't think it's your possession because of any good you've done or because of who your parents are, or because of how often you go to church and you do this good thing and that thing. The only way you get into the feast is through the door, Jesus. That's why it's narrow. It's not narrow because you have to do a bunch of hard tasks to get in. It's narrow because there's one way, Jesus. He's the only way we get there. So, have you... Become complacent and entitled in your faith. Have you taken it for granted or are you doing it even now? In what way? The words of Jesus invite us to ask this question of ourselves today. Not so that we can despair in our failures, but so that we stop looking at ourselves and instead look to him. For within ourselves there's nothing but rot and despair. Nothing but an enemy of God who runs from the great treasures that God wishes to give him. But in Christ, all of those things are given freely of his gracious love. Jesus wants you at the feast. That's why he's saying all of these things. He's asking you to be on guard Because there are forces at work in the world that don't want you there. And some of those forces are inside you. Your old sinful flesh wants to draw you away. The devil and the world, they want to draw you away. They want to distract you. Because they don't want you to be able to recline at the table of the Lord. So Jesus warns you of them. Be on guard. Be on guard against the world, against the work of of the devil and against your own sinful flesh. Look at me. Follow me. Believe in me. I am the door, he says in John, and he opens for sinners like you and me. So dear friends in Christ, be on guard. Be on guard of all that would lead you to think there's somewhere and some way else you can get to the heavenly feast other than Jesus, not within yourself, not within the world, only in him. So listen to our, Lord, our Lord's word this morning. Cling to him in faith. Flee from thinking your works will bring you through the door. Flee from thinking that because God loves you, you can ignore him. Instead, find rest today for your soul. Rest in the work of Jesus, and by faith, heed his word. In the name of Jesus, amen.